Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Summerford Associates podcast. We take your burning issues in IT and cybersecurity and delve into them by discussing them with our clients and our uh, technology providers. So you get insights into the best practices and trends. And I think we're really privileged at Summerford because um, we help clients across the board with their challenges. So for you listeners, you get a free insight into what your peers are doing elsewhere. Now today, we're aiming to um, talk about um, observability, but what I mean by that is that you're in charge of your company's monitoring practice. Uh, you may have various titles, but basically you're ensure of making sure that the apps or websites that you present to your customers are up and running smoothly and there's no holdups in any of the infrastructure that supports that. Um, I know that your customers may be internal as well, so they may not be people who are buying stuff through your websites. Every company has this kind of need. And so we're exploring two main areas that we are seeing discussed again and again by um, people in this monitoring area. And we thought it would be really interesting for you to hear what we've been hearing as well. So, Chris, why don't you introduce yourself so, so yeah. people know why you're here? Well, thanks for having me on again. Uh, this, this topic is fun because the terminology we use in the tech field it can it can seem very clear at times and then extremely nuanced at other times and i'm afraid the term observability is one of those so i really appreciate you taking the time to to kind of say the roles that are concerned about observability versus making observability the thing that the role needs to do my name is chris riley i am a devops devrel advocate at splunk which basically means that my career as a software developer was not fantastic, um, but I could not give it up. I could not give up the obsession of um, how modern application delivery was evolving. And so I've been attaching to my, that, myself to that for the last 13 years. And it's been very, very interesting into the world of DevOps. And now what we're talking with in the world of microservices, Kubernetes and observability. Yes, well, welcome, and it's perfect um, to to talk with you about it. And I'm very much role focused because everyone is uh, we define it so differently. In fact, I think it's important that we just draw a line in the sand now and define observability. Would you do that F from your perspective, so people don't sort of think that we're talking about something different? Yeah, yeah, it's oddly controversial the term observability. Um, I think that. I have a good sense of where everyone's come from when they've when they've embraced this term. It could be from the perspective of the data, where people think observability is traces and spans. It's become kind of synonymous with traces and spans, which is a new data set that uh, you use in m modern monitoring practices. We don't really look at observability as the data, and we don't look at it as a specific tool that you just buy and start using. We look at observability more as a practice, a practice that you align technical capabilities to. The purpose of this practice is, surprise, it's just monitoring. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this practice is to keep pace with the new complexities we see in modern applications. So that's Kubernetes, microservices, where infrastructure boundaries and application boundaries have blurred where you can't rely on just going to the log as your starting point, where those who are on call, which in this world, anybody can be on call, need to have incidents pushed to them. They can't go hunting. And so really, we are talking about a rebranding of monitoring to cover these new complexities. And that's why it's a useful term. And when I look at any terminology, I will assimilate, assimilate the term into my vocabulary at the point that the solution, the problem space is big enough. And in order to have a meaningful conversation about that problem space, you need a new term. But the reality is we are talking about the people and the processes and the technical capabilities that ensure that modern applications are up and running and meeting user expectations. Roger. 
Okay, so that's what you mean when you talk about observability. Cool, I think that's clear. But when we're talking to people who are in charge of that in their organizations, what are the main things that we are struggling with as an industry right now? Yeah, it's it, honestly, it's been really fun in the last two years because we're not having a lot of unicorn hypey conversations like we used to have, where it seems like you have enterprises who are trying to keep up with the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters. You have people dealing with very real problems. Once you start digging into these conversations, you find out that maybe the leading problem is culture. And I know that that term can be frustrating for some because it's hard to operate operationalize culture. But I guarantee that you can spot it when it's not there. Yeah. And, and a good example of that is um, the application a team delivers is a reflection of the team itself. If you are a techie, you have at some point in time gotten, for your own personal uses, gotten a piece of software, a subscription, a SaaS service, et cetera, that you looked at it and you go, you know what, the team behind this is not performing very well. It's it's obvious to me. The functionality is kind of clunky. They didn't really think about user experience. Um, it's not very responsive. The uptime is not great it actually becomes very obvious. So what's the difference between that low performing engineering team and the engineering team behind that SaaS application that you love and you're, you keep your- So reliant on, on, yeah. <laughs> right. If you ask the engineering managers in those two teams, they're not gonna say that their talent is bad. Nobody wants to believe that they've hired bad engineers. And I think that we should all agree that that's probably the case. They've hired very talented technical individuals. So what's the only thing left? The only thing left is culture. So organizations have to embrace this new SRE model. They have to think about going from firefighting to stewardship and strategy. They have so to SRE meaning? Uh... Site reliability engineering. Okay. Yeah. And you don't, in some teams, I've heard cloud operation teams just rename themselves to SRE, but it, that doesn't really work. Just renaming yourself doesn't solve the problem. But you certainly need to think about this new mindset. Otherwise, what ends up happening is those who own monitoring, and if you own monitoring today, you know this. One of the challenges you have is that your teams are one off monitoring things like you have one team monitoring things this way another team monitoring things another way you always have one team that's doing a great job and another team that doesn't want to have anything to do with it um, you spend a lot of time creating dashboards and customizations and that is not going to keep pace with the amount of change and transformation in modern application development environments. So even though it doesn't feel fun to think about that kind of stuff, because it's not turning screws and, and typing command line, uh, it's absolutely critical to success. So it's all about culture. And you think the culture one needs to adopt is a site reliability engineering mindset. Yeah, it's, it's in the name the name has nothing to do with with the approach itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just the name that the tech forward companies are using. The approach is this. It's it's about stewardship and it's about enablement. It's about okay. spending more time being a peer to your engineers and helping them execute on what they need to do. And you said it earlier, you have internal customers. You should mm -hmm. almost always think about your engineering team as the customer of the observability practice. And if you treat it like that, then you really have this product mindset where you're iterating on functionality, you're, you're um, doing what you need to do to listen to the customer to help them be more successful. But also sometimes you're encouraging best practices, right? Like um, how do you establish SLI, service level objectives, service level indicators? Those are all things, stumbling blocks that a lot of organizations just can't get past. And until they can get past it, there's no real reason or hope to implement the technical capabilities you need to get it done, like traces and spans. Yeah, I see. So, oh, it's really spun it on its head because most of us engineers would start by thinking of a tool and what you're going to monitor. But you're thinking, no, 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 just start with that mindset of being 
that of those engineers being your customer and you're having to um you're you're making their products monitorable and helping them see how they're performing and really be successful Ooh, yeah, I mean, okay. there, there, there is no doubt that if you were just to dive in with the tools first approach, that you will very quickly come up with a solution. The thing is, it has a shelf life. Mm-hmm. And what every organization, it, it's funny to me when I talk to organizations about transformation, and they treat it as if it's a project that they're going to do, and they're going to be done at some point. That's never been the case. I've never met a company who wasn't in continuous transformation. They don't want to acknowledge it, but they always are transforming. So the, the goal is to pave the road and not make roadblocks. And you can't pave the road if you're only thinking about, all right, we need to improve this about our logs or we need to all we need to do today is make sure that we understand what's going on in kubernetes don't worry about tracing and spans that, that comes down the road let's just focus on what's happening in kubernetes you will hit a wall you will always hit a wall and so you have to always be three thinking three steps ahead of your transformation for the visibility that you need for that transformation the other thing is if you don't, you have nothing to measure it by. You would never have a baseline. You can never compare because at every wall that you hit, you make a radical change where all the visualization, all the understanding you have prior is not no longer relevant. Uh, so you're thinking because it all goes so quickly, you need to be adopting something in a culture and a tool that that will be able to cope with these kind of um changes before they happen. yeah and i say transformation and change should be a feature of your environment mm. it's not something you address it's not a challenge you are trying to solve it is a feature that paves the road for you i just it's slightly overwhelming to know how would you know what that thing is? I think that's where cut stewardship comes in. So um, to give you an example, like it, it, it all comes, it all comes down to, you know, what are the people responsible for monitoring in your organization? What are they able to invest energy in? Most of the time, they are set up to only invest energy in firefighting, mm. creating new dashboards, solving current problems. But if you reform the structure of the organization where they are being strategic, so they are um, thinking ahead of you know what's happening today, then they can do things like our SRE team does. They can make onboarding service onboarding checklists. They can make maturity models. They can go to events and understand what other organizations are doing or speak with companies such as yourself to find out best practices, et cetera, and create a North Star. The problem is most organizations don't have a North Star. They have immediately what's in front of them. Yeah, so they're so busy doing the urgent firefighting or being a dashboard monkey or something like yeah. that because they've set it up to that that it's very non-centralized as to right. who does it. That you can't get that north star of where you ought to be heading. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you ha, have you worked with some companies that have done it well that you you know how they structured it and how they've changed those um roles to be more stewardship roles? Yeah, I have. Well, so some in industry, I will point out, is is particularly interesting is um, Delta Airlines, U.S. Bank, Target. So these are these are just companies out in the industry. You can find out, you know, the stuff they've done. I pick them deliberately because they are not tech companies. Yes, yeah, really tech, good. Yeah, they are tech enabled companies, meaning they have to be concerned about DevOps. They need to deliver high quality applications also, but they are not in the business of that. Um, but also uh, Splunk. We are going through transformation ourselves. We are converting our on-prem core product to a cloud-based product, and we have cloud-native applications with our Splunk infrastructure monitoring, APM, on-call, et cetera, that were built cloud-native. So we have a mix of both, and and I get to experience that. I, I actually really enjoy spending a lot of time with our SRE teams and our DevOps and our developer productivity teams. Yeah. So... One of the trends I've seen 
and I'm in particular with um, the tech-enabled enterprises. In, in, in the, I actually ran into a job rec um, just today at US Bank that um, I wanted to pull up here. The job rec is principal product manager. So as soon as you hear that word, principal product manager, oh, this they must be selling, building a product. But the title is principal product manager, DevOps and technology modernization. Wow. So this person's role and what they're hiring for, and there's a whole VP in this organization that their only job is to facilitate transformation across U.S. Bank, across the engineering team. Mm. And so what they are treating monitoring like a product. And what I've seen companies do is reform to this mindset where the owners of monitoring are actually product managers. They have feature backlogs. They iterate on that. They do PI planning. But there, of course, is the services element. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that you get best practices out there and so forth? And the way I've seen that most successful, because a lot of times these teams don't have the ability to dictate. They can't go to a engineering team and say, you must use this tool in this way. Most of the time that doesn't work. So instead, they invest in building culture via dojos and and socialization and advocacy, really. Mm -hmm. But also... What I like is this, if you're delivering a product to your organization, which is monitoring, you should have versions. Version one is you get a login. Of course you do. That's really clever. Sorry, that's such an (laughs) aha moment. Carry on, carry on, sorry. No problem. So version one is you get access. Uh Good for you. You have a login. You're on your own. Version two is you get white glove access. So because... You did the appropriate things to onboard your service, to define your SLIs, your SLOs, whatever it is. At Splunk, we have service onboarding checklists. Because you did that, you get white glove access. What white glove access gets you is these pre-built dashboards and this additional support. Now, that might seem counterintuitive. You might say, well, doesn't that just encourage people not to do the right thing? Well, in addition to that, you need to find that team in your organization who really wants this, who is just on board with you, and you need to make them a rock star because FOMO or or peer pressure, and I am advocating peer pressure here, which is not something you would do with your kids in school, but I'm advocating peer pressure. It works. Yeah. It works really well because other teams want the support of each other. And so if you see other people getting on board with the premium package of monitoring, mm. the others will come. So you're saying um, to get this culture right, people who aren't even technical businesses can do it. You really can. If you have some roles where you are thinking that monitoring is a product and you deal it with it as professionally like that and you incentivize the services that you provide by if if your clients are doing it better they get a better service from you so you're almost kind of well you're rewarding that best practice of monitoring you're rewarding the pay- yeah and and i've seen organizations do it in different ways gannett publishing in the u uh, um, who owns usa today and a whole bunch of media outlets mm-hmm. They have a sticky situation where they're they grow by acquiring media companies, and they're oh, small, okay. but they just crank through them. That, I mean, they they acquire these companies left and right. Every time they do, they get a new engineering team and a new stack. Yeah. So it is unreasonable for them to go in and say, "Nope, you're tomorrow. You're going to change everything and use our stack because that'll stop everything for six months. That's not going to work." No. But what they do is they say. This is the stack we would like you to use. If you use it, you will get 100% support from us. If you don't use it, you get zero support from us. And again, it's this whole like, well, my peers are going to be more successful because they're following the plan. Mm -hmm. And I want to follow the plan too, because there is a productivity to that, being able to learn from the knowledge of the rest of the broader team. So yes, I think that this strategy works really well and it gets over the hurdle of, yes, but I don't get to decide for other people what they do. 
And at yeah. US Bank, they have a whole advocacy function that that's all they do is go around and educate engineering teams on what is the best mode of operation. Wow. That's, I mean, it's just a, it's a really great way of thinking of that culture. Okay. And so other than these cultural issues, like how you get people to work to the best practice, how you structure your teams, what you do for the roles, what else are people thinking about in terms of observability or the practice of monitoring? What, what other kind of area yeah. is there? And that's where we get into the meat of it and where everything everybody wants to get, right? And that's why I encourage people to get the culture stuff addressed so that you can focus on the fun stuff. And the fun stuff <laughs> us is is bits and bytes. Um, so you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it kind of from the data journey mm -hmm. of observability. Um, because you have to get each stage correct to be successful. I mean, we've all heard this garbage in, garbage out, right? But I, I don't know if everybody really takes seriously what that means because it's not just the data. It's the transport of the data as well. And it's the metadata. So garbage mm -hmm. in, garbage out is not a trivial thing. And it starts with the data itself. So in the world of observability, we are we're switching our approach where when we had that one server, we always knew every two weeks we had to restart it. We would go to the log. We would always start at the log because we knew where the server is both physically and logically mm -hmm. in microservices applications. The engineer cannot in their brain hold a mental model of where everything is. It's not possible. So you can't start with the log. The log is the destination. So the first thing that has to change is this pull versus push. So we're used to pull, go to the log first. Now we need to push. Give me the incident that gets me to the log if I need to get there, but hopefully I don't. So it's now it's saying, okay, you still need to see the root cause of whatever, but in the past, you, you knew where it was because it was such a simple architecture. It was so static. You could just go and pull that information. But now you have to be pushed like something's got to tell you something's wrong and give you a bit of a hint as to where to go. Exactly. It's so complex now. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Yeah. So that gets us to the new data set, which is okay. traces and spans. Yeah. In a microservices-based application, you have many small services. With monitoring, you're monitoring the service itself yep. and the relationship between the services as well. So you kind of have a new element here, which incorporates the dependencies. But the problem is, as a service owner, I don't know what the dependencies are necessarily. If I'm developing my service correctly, anybody can send a data, anybody can consume data from it, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we want, but it creates a new set of problems. Yeah. So we need to monitor the transactions between services as well. And that comes with a new data set called traces and spans. So a trace is every hop inside of your application that a transaction, a user transaction flows through. Mm -hmm. A span is the duration and the activity within each individual service as it's in that service. So they're all glued together. So it allows you to, for example, if an API gateway is the thing that's throwing the event, the alert, the incident, but the actual problem is a user database, you can more easily spot that. In the log first world, you would go to the API gateway logs and you would have no clue and you would waste a lot of time. So that new data set is critical. That gets the second bit, which is you have to instrument for that. So yeah. instrumentation or at Splunk, we use this beautiful term called GDI, getting data in. It's like one of those most, I don't know, silly terms because it's so, so obvious. Um, getting Instrumenting and getting data in correctly is is very important. Um, that's why I'm so excited about the Open Telemetry project, which is an uh, open source project with the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, it is maturing, and it is likely going to be a standard for a lot of enterprises of how they instrument because they can do it in a repeatable way. That'll be so that is good. Irrelevant of their monitoring platform. That, I mean, I, I'm really glad Splunk are way behind that one because. Um, We'll have so many clients who have, hopefully in 10 years' time, or maybe that's way too far ahead, um, soon, 
because everything will be instrumented using the Open Telemetry project, you could swap vendors willy nilly and you'd still have everything still sending data in. And that's yeah. really good client first thinking because otherwise, you know, that that's such a big barrier to entry into into these tools, isn't it? And I think that's the key word barrier because organizations are choosing what they use to monitor based on how they get the data in. And that doesn't mm, seem to make sense. That doesn't make sense. We're just trying to transport information from point A to point B, yeah. but we have to do it in a successful way. So yes, it is it is extremely powerful and it's unshackling. That's that's global as well, isn't it? Because the open yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously there's standards across the world which aren't global still, like voltages of mains power. For example. Like, you <laughs> yeah, know, we get around it, it with transformers, but this and, is and I guess I should be careful of using the term standard. It's kind of like Dora metrics. They become a organically become a quote unquote standard, but they're not official IEEE, you know. No, no, they're standard. not mandated, but they're a general kind yeah. of adopted thing. Yeah, and there is a really good as a part of the open telemetry project there's a really good open telemetry definition which is quote unquote your standard and then the open telemetry collector is the technical implementation of that and it can be done at the code level and it can be done by an agent level etc by the way you have to decide what you're going to do this is all part of instrumentation because if you have a team of 100 engineers so your greatest resolution comes if you implement at a code level you will yeah. be able to add more metadata via what's called tags. Mm -hmm. The problem is one developer will be really good at it, have a lot of great tags that give you a lot of information, and another developer will have zero because yeah. they won't do it at all. So that consistency also matters. And, and you know, these are all things we don't want to think about, but they're infrastructure problems. Sure again. <laughs> and we have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agents are great because you don't have to worry about it, but you get the least resolution with yeah. agents. Yeah. So we've moved from just data pulled, now pushing, traces and spans, and then instrumentation. Is there a final step in such journey? <laughs> well, so if you did these correctly, like this yeah. is your groundwork. If you did these correctly, hopefully the, the next steps, and this is where the tooling comes in, the next steps are more natural and, and, and much easier to, to implement. And so that's where you get your, your um, metrics. Um, you start building your dashboards from an infrastructure level, from an application level with APM. And then you start creating meaningful detectors to spot anomalies or create incidents. It's important to remember that an alert is not an incident. An yes. alert is like the check engine light on your car. Something's broken. We don't really know what about it, much about it. An incident, we know a lot more about it, and we know it's impacting the business, and we know it's impacting our users. So that's where having an on-call incident response strategy is important to take all of that context you're getting and put it in front of those who are on call so that the meantime to detect, meantime to recover is as quick and as, and as um, useful as possible. And how you do that is by making sure that you can see a history of similar incidents, yep. making sure that you can build, bring responders into a firefight based on their history of resolving incidents so that you are bringing in the best talent. You're not just reaching out to that one person who fixes everything. But, you know, this is all so analogous to the um, to the security world now. So I know that a buzzword is DevSecOps, but the whole idea that um, the monitoring group would be a like a responder and have to correlate alerts to instance and have this kind of mm -hmm. structure is so are people in different clients actually you know lifting and shifting the processes that they have in their socks to this or is that yes yes and i would love to have just a whole conversation on dev devsecops because that's another area similar to observability where it's a practice not a tool mm. um but yes they are and i i think that this is what happens in traditional monitoring, the security professional and the monitoring professional's understanding of the application starts after it's been built, compiled, and running. It starts yeah. at runtime. 
Like they only they only know their application from that point. Well, a lot happens prior to that. A whole bunch happens prior to that. So what we're trying to do is give them as much context as possible and enrich the data that they get so that we get to resolution faster and, and identification faster so that we can start addressing issues before they actually get in the hands of the customer or before it's a vulnerability that has already been exploited and on the news and you realize later, oh, we're one of them too. We better address this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, and this kind of idea, uh, have we covered how it works with our microservices and Kubernetes. Yeah, I mean, that's really where, you know, traces and spans are going to come in. And one thing yes, to yes, know yes. about Kubernetes is we, when we start to think about our tech stack, we have the compute infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But now we have a new type of infrastructure, which is application. I call it application infrastructure. So that's Kubernetes. That's your your nodes, your pods, mm -hmm. um, and and your containers and everything around that. So you actually have to monitor those two things separately. Your compute infrastructure. We're we're fairly familiar with how to monitor this Kubernetes infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Then you have application layer. So this is what we were talking about with traces and spans. So the relationship yeah. between services, how tracks transactions through through all the services. If you're a service owner, you have a contract essentially with the rest of the service owners on what your service will take in and what it will output. And thus you have performance related to that contract. And that's where you get your service level indicators. Then above that, we go into digital experience monitoring. So the front end, so real user monitoring, synthetics, et cetera. And Splunk, everything that Splunk is doing right now is to make sure that we create visibility at every single one of those layers so that there is a thread that goes all the way from the activity in the software delivery chain through to production and, and your SIM and your production uh, environments because we think that that's how organizations should be thinking about it and that's how they build ahead of the curve. That's how they make sure that they have visibility into the future, not visibility with what I just need to solve today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the powerful um, element of having it all in one place that uh, Spunk's as a ability suite can, can give you. Um, quite excited about that and then the yeah. other thing that I, I guess people talk a lot about um that we need to think about when we're monitoring is that lag and that delay um, and whether we're looking at stuff that's 10 minutes late or just sampled or whether we're we're really seeing what's actually happening is that yeah is that what people so, talk about too they do you know um sampling the the impact of sampling changes a lot once you start monitoring your front end Okay, yeah. Because if you sample, you you lose a tremendous amount of information that is helpful from the user perspective. Um, because there's a lot of nuanced things that can go on with your application that you would potentially never have a chance to catch. So the way I look at full fidelity is your opportunity to catch things. <laughs> you know, you still have to be very meaningful with how you visualize and how you get it in, but you need full fidelity because that's your opportunity. Otherwise, you don't even have the opportunity to catch it. No. Um, so, so that's one thing, full fidelity. In terms of this term real time, and nothing is real time. No. And I might maybe I can get beat up for that. I don't know. But the the what matters is when you're looking at your platform that time scale between you know when something happens in production when you get it is absolutely critical especially if you're using serverless where we talked about microservices well things get even more complicated when you talk about serverless where the function might already be dead by the time that you see what broke inside of it and so that gets kind of complicated so you're dealing with millisecond time and you need to think about the platform being able to take in that data in millisecond time but also at scale. Yeah. Um, because time and, and scale matter as well. And, and of course, you need to consider all these things. Of course, I think that Splunk is the most real time. And I think that we can support things at scale better than anybody else. But you, you have to figure that out for yourself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Big caveat. I mean, we're, we're Splunk partners. 
you're from Splunk. Of course we think that, but all of the things that we've been talking about are actually across anyone doing monitoring. And it's been really interesting to get an insight because clearly you speak to to people who are grappling with these issues day in, day out across all different types of industry. Um, so it, it is really nice to hear the common themes that are coming up. So around that culture and around where you're at in that journey. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been very stimulating. Thank you, Chris. Well, that's my goal, because I just want you to invite me back again yeah. some other episode. <laughs> <laughs> Our last podcast we did with HashiCorp as well, and yes. um, you completely blew my mind with what might happen in the future um, of observability. Um, and uh, that podcast has gone, um, well, it hasn't gone viral. But it is is our equivalent of viral. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. It, it's micro viral. I mean, micro -viral. Did anything viral in the <laughs> DevOps industry? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it, within our context, it's yeah. pretty successful. But where would people go to um, hear more from you or hear more from Summerford? What, where, where do you want to point people to? Ah, yes. Well. First thing is, is we have this awesome um, observability for rookies. It's based on our, our observability cloud workshop that you can kind of run self-paced with our trials. And, and maybe we should include the link for the self pace in the description, yes. but also working with an organization like yourself that can potentially organize one of those events. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun too, and it's very, you know, hackathon-ish. But Conf is coming up. So this is our big annual conference on October 18th. I hope we better validate that <laughs> with within that time frame. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a hybrid conference where it's both on uh, physical and in virtual. So you, you can get access to content wherever you are. And there's a great breadth, there's a whole track around of observability that I, I totally recommend you join because we have a ton of customer um, scenarios. And, and like you just said, you know, the, the reason I'm able to do what I'm able to do is I talk to the unicorns, I talk to the tech enabled enterprises who are just figuring out how to move their applications into the cloud. And it's the simulation of all of that, that, that really makes you successful in moving the needle forward. Yeah, great. So we'll put some links to .com for sure and the rookies. I think that um, my marketing team in Summerford are putting on a hands-on um, uh, observability for rookies thing soon. So we'll put links to that anyway. And uh, yeah, just reach out if you're interested in what we were talking about and what those case studies, they sound really interesting too, like Delta Airlines and people like that. Um, yes. Thank you so much for spending the time to discuss Thank this. Thank you. Today. And uh, yep. have a nice rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>